Matt Veer, back for round two. Let me back. Surprised you're having me back here. You know, I thought the last what podcast we did came out pretty well. A lot of listens, a lot of comments, generated hey, a lot of discussions. So, yeah, man, it's, I think you're a regular now. All right, I love it. So, well, what do you have in store for us today? Because we kind of have a loose agenda, but you kind of got, got a lot playing it close to the vest. You know, I was telling you a little bit that some of my favorite podcasts that I listen to are kind of like what my podcast is in general. You'll bring different people on to talk about whatever topic you want, but then occasionally they'll just have like a friend on to talk and then you're just kind of talking about whatever and you see where the conversation goes. And then next mm -hmm. thing you know, you're down some rabbit hole that you didn't think you'd get to. But yeah, there's a few things to chat about, dude. You get a lot of stuff going on in life. So I figured we just kind of chat and see what happens. You up for if, it? If I, do, if I do remember correctly, our last pod was one of your longest ones. So we'll try to keep this one under two, two hours. Or... <laughs> Let's go three, dude. Podcast. Set a new record. Let's set a new record. Uh, I'll have Tara put the kids to bed tonight. We'll, we'll just see if we can pull an all-nighter. <laughs> That'll work well. <laughs> yeah, that should work. Work great. First thing I want to talk about, you and the fam went to Washington, D.C. last month for Wreaths Across yeah. America. And I think Wreaths Across America is an awesome thing. Tell me about that trip. Tell me about the Wreaths Across America part. How was that? Yeah, so that is really cool. First off, won't take credit for that. It was introduced to me by Michelle through, I think, Girl Scouts. We got introduced to that Girl by Girl Scouts. And I don't, I'm trying to think, and maybe Michelle will probably know the answer to this. I don't know if we were doing it before that Girl Scouts trip in 2019. Well, we might, we might have been doing it in the cemeteries locally. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I know it was going on and it hadn't gotten its big kick up yet. But I was first introduced to that when Milan and Michelle went to D.C. for Reese Cross America in 2019. Tara uh, and Aubrey went with them. That's right. That's right. So and it was, was definitely a Girl Scout and, thing. Yeah, you saw pictures of them in their ponchos and stuff like that in front of the White House, stuff like that. So that was really cool, you know. Then we were we've been doing it every every subsequent year after that. So 2020 pandemic year, I think we went to the St. Joseph Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Same thing with 2021. I think we went to St. Joseph Cemetery too as well. But then last year and this year we both we flew down last year to reach across America in D.C. Mm -hmm. And then this year we drove down because we wanted to do a little bit more sightseeing with yeah. regards to, I mean D.C. There's a lot of cool stuff within walking distance, that National Mall area. Like, you can walk yeah. a lot of different things. And if not, it's like a minimal Uber to, like, the Lincoln Memorial or even if you want to do Uber to Arlington, right? Mm -hmm. But there are some things outside of D.C. that are really worth seeing. You know, the Air and Space Museum that's in Virginia is yeah. about a 45-minute drive away. We want to see that. That's where, you know, Michelle has the SR-71 that's there. I think they have the Endeavor in there as well. Which is a shuttle? Uh, space shuttle. Yeah, space shuttle. It's that's cool. so cool. Got that so surreal to see that. Then we also did Mount Vernon, you know, drove to Mount Vernon, which that was my probably one of my favorite parts of the trip because if you've never been to Mount Vernon, you could spend the whole day there as well. Yeah. See all the we'll, we'll get back to D.C. then. Tell me about Mount Vernon, man. I've never been there. It's never been on my radar to go there. I obviously know what it is. And correct me if I'm wrong, actually, but this is just George Washington's residence? It's one of them. Yeah, so George Washington... Them. Got, I mean, there's a whole long story. It's been in the Washington family forever. It was actually his grandfather that got the land from, I think, I don't think it was King James, one of the or King, one of the kings, right? I mean, it might have been King James, I don't know. But his, his father gets the land, his grandfather gets the land, and gets bequeathed to his father. Then George Washington actually has a stepbrother uh, who inherits it after his father. So the stepbrother doesn't last, he doesn't live very long. In his 20s or 30s. So then George Washington comes to own Mount Vernon, I think, in his early mid 20s, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's a show of its former self, and through the years, Washington just keeps adding on to it. He puts different things on here, and he builds an architecture in that too. Um, and he adds all these outbuildings, and he ends up doing everything from new ways to farm to making his own whiskey to just, just different things. So mm -hmm. At one point, I might be talking out of turn here. I'm trying to drop a memory. I think it was like 600 acres or 6,000 yeah. acres. And now now it's a, little, you know, a lot smaller than its original self. But just the history there, you're walking around, and he's actually interred there too. Like he is, His sarcophagus is there, and he's buried there. So they have That's a little so cool. building where, where he's buried and stands legitimately like five feet from George Washington. For me, that stuff is kind of surreal, you know, like – well, George Washington, you don't get any bigger than that. <clears throat> like growing up, I mean, everyone knows who George Washington is. This guy has a yeah. tremendous impact on our on the country. All right. I just wanted to take one second from the podcast, to let you know that besides hosting, I also do mortgages. I'm a residential loan officer with Norcom Mortgage in Saco, Maine. 
If you or anyone you know is thinking about buying a home in 2024 or refinancing as rates are coming down, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to help. My contact information is in the description below. Thanks and back to the pod. How far is that from DC? That took us about a half hour to get to. I don't know how good with we're in New England. We're measure everything in time. You know, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you how many miles it was. It's, 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 it's an easy trip. It's an easy trip. And, and you make Michelle drive you around everywhere. So you're, you're just out to lunch. You're not even paying attention. <laughs> so, I mean, everybody knows I can't drive in big, big cities and she eats that. She loves it. You know, she loves it. I can't kidding. deal with the stress. So, I mean, it could have been a half hour drive. It could have been a four hour drive. You weren't paying attention anyways. You guys just know that you got there. It wasn't too far away. Yeah, I mean to kind of to kind of tie it in, and Michelle be the first one. As soon as I left DC, as I was checking the DraftKings app so I could put in the better. I'm like, that's that no cool. So if you left DC, it could have been a four hour trip. I don't know. Yeah. I was immersed in my yeah, phone. I think it was in Georgia. Father of the year there. So anyway, <laughs> so Mount Vernon's legit. I, I having that's talked awesome. to you about it, it's like added to my list next time we go to DC because we do love going to like DC and all that American history that's around there in the you know radius hour or two from from the city. A ton of cool stuff. You'd love it because – so I didn't even know what to expect. I didn't do much reading on Mount Vernon. I knew of its existence. I knew what it was. I knew it was George Washington's estate. I knew that's where he lived and it's where he passed away. But I didn't know too much other than that on you know Mount Vernon and like what to expect. So like we did two tours, which is kind of cool. Michelle booked them both. One of them was just the estate tour. You get to walk yep. around the house. I got a lot of cool pictures. You know, George Washington's bedroom, kitchen, his private study, his den. A little about in the day of the life of what he would do. He'd get up, he'd go, you know, tend to the horses or go to check out his crops, stuff like that. Then we did the other tour, which was the National Treasure Tour. You know, the Nick Cage movie. So yeah. Mount Vernon is Mount Vernon is a film destination that they used in National Treasures Two, Book of Secrets. So they never saw it. Never seen it. Oh man, the kids would love that too. You know, Nicholas um, Cage wasn't in that one though, right? Yeah, he was. Yep, he yep. was. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So they kind of do the the filming on that. They show where they filmed the wedding. There's a scene in there where they film the that sitting president's birthday at Mount Vernon. Yep. So there's the there's the Potomac. There's all that kind of cool stuff that's right there because Mount Vernon's on the Potomac, right? So. Um, there's just a lot of cool things that that tour kind of engulfed. It's about an hour tour, and it showed you all the, the different things, and That's they awesome. kind of disbelieved the they dispel the myth that there's all these tunnels under under Mount Vernon. There's no tunnels under Mount Vernon. There's one tunnel that's the ice house, so that when they were chopping chunks of uh, ice out of the Potomac, that that they, they, they had this ice house to keep it to keep it you know cold, and it, it, it was kind of well insulated because you figure you're chopping ice out in you know January when the Potomac mm -hmm. freezes. That ice house could keep ice until June. Oh wow! Which was pretty, which is pretty cool. Yeah, because George Washington loved his ice cream. That's another little known fact. So. <laughs> no kidding. I'm bummed about yeah. the no tunnels. I would Sorry. think that place has to have all kinds of tunnels or spin zone. Maybe they just don't want to tell you about the tunnels, and they're still there. Um, cool. Well, Love it. I definitely add it to the hit list. So back to DC, wreaths across okay. America. Is there a ton of people at this thing? Yeah. 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 Like people travel from all over the place to go and you basically, you get there as your family and there's like a central place and they're like, okay, here's the wreaths. You go to this part of the cemetery and lay they them. Don't, they don't assign which part you go to. So one of the cool things we've been doing every year is Milan, that inaugural year that they went with, you and Otara and Aubrey went, Milan and Michelle went, they laid the wreath on the headstone of someone named Marcus Aurelius Goodrich. Mm -hmm. And we lay the wreath on his headstone every time we go there. Oh, wow. So we go to that section of the cemetery. Milan says his name out loud. Milan did a little research on him. You know, World War II vet. Just a real cool, like, it's a real cool story. So we do that as a family every single, every time we go there. That's that's where we lay the wreath on. But, you know, did so you grab this, that name just because, did you pick that person just because of the Marcus Aurelius part? Or like... Well, Okay. That was Milan's decision. That that was the name. So one of the things they told them, Michelle would explain this a lot better. One of the things they told the Girl Scout troop in 2019 is when you stand in front of the name, try to do a little research on that person after you've after so that was a name that wasn't that they didn't choose ahead of time. That was a name mm -hmm. that she stood in front of that she chose. And then she did a little research on him after the fact, which was pretty cool. And I don't know if Milan ended up sending a letter to the to the family or not. Trying to research who the family was just to let them know that we, you know, his, uh, you know, he wasn't alone during the holidays. With you know, they paid their respects with the wreaths yeah. and so on and so forth. So, 
But we went down to Reach Across America is always on Saturday. And we went down there, I think, the Wednesday or Tuesday before to kind of kind of be there. That Reach Across America Day was one of our last days, actually, in, in yeah. D.C. And, you know, we woke up 6 o'clock out the hotel at 630. If you're, you, you've been to D.C. before, you know that, that Arlington is across the Potomac in, in Virginia, right? It's not in yeah. Washington, D.C. Yeah. You can see it from the Lincoln Memorial, right? So what we usually do is we take an Uber, we get dropped off at the Lincoln Memorial, then we walk over the Freedom Bridge, and it's kind of cool walking into you know, Virginia over the Potomac. I mean, yep. that's a very, very, that's a cool bridge. It's a very impressive bridge that you walk yeah. over. And then but even though Arlington got, is in, even though the cemetery is in Virginia, it is all still very walkable. Um, oh, correct. Yeah. yeah. We, it's, if you don't plan on walk, so what, that's one of the things about Arlington. Reach across America, Arlington, Arlington National Cemetery has a lot to see in and of itself aside from doing research across America, right? Yeah. You've got the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. You've got General Lee's house. You've got all these, you know, you've got the Kennedy Eternal Flame. You've got the Challenger plaque. So there's a lot of things to see in Arlington other than uh, research across America. So the only reason we don't walk to the cemetery, you could walk it, is you're going to get 10 miles of walking in that day already, you know, with all the things you do. So, so that, that was fun. So we, you, you know, you get in the line, they open the gates up at eight o'clock. So we were, we were in line at seven fifteen. we got there, like we were, I wouldn't say we were one of the first, but there was definitely wasn't an established line yet. Yeah. Um, then like within a half hour, you turn around and then there was like way back the, the, the street to get in. And that's, you know, it was pretty cool seeing all the people show up in droves, you know, and if you, you know, Greg Morin, right. Sounds very fire. Uh, Brown dog trucking. Okay. Yep. So, so M Michelle talks to him a lot. I actually, you know, I graduated with Greg, but he's on the board of Reese Across America. So we saw him in Arlington. He had his two trucks down there. He does a lot for the cause to get Reese down there to truck in Reese. It's, it's really cool. Uh, so there were some people we saw. And then when we were in line, two people behind us, Portland PD, dressed in their, dressed in their blues, you know, yeah. dressed in their dress blues. Yeah. Just there. Um, paying their respects or, you know, I don't know what they were there for, obviously, Reach Across America, but maybe it was something that was something more. like that. It's reasonable uh, to think that they were, right? That's the whole 100%. idea. It's kind of cool because Reach Across America, I mean, most people know this that are where we live, but they, they'll drive those trucks right down Route 1. And the day yeah. that those trucks are going through Southern Maine and all the way down to D.C., like, you know about it. It's a thing. It's like, oh, people are talking like, hey, today's Reach Across yeah. America Day because you'll see all the all the cops go by. You'll see all the trucks go by. From my office, Ooh. you can actually kind of see a sliver of, of Main Street in Saco. And you can see when we were right on Saco before, it would be like, you know, right there. So it's very cool to think that it, we participated in a, in a small way just by observing Found, the truck. Founded in Maine, though. Started in Maine. Originated yeah. in Maine. You know, and it comes from up north. I can't, you know, my wife will probably kill me because I don't know the, the actual origination. But I think it started in like 2012, 2013. Yeah. Just started making a few reads to go on. And it turned into this big thing where that convoy is legit. It takes that convoy, what, four or five days to get down to D.C. Because mm -hmm. it does do, it doesn't go like right down 95. It does all the, like, you know, like you said, you saw it on Main Street, right? So they're taking, yeah. they're, it's a big deal. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's Main Street's probably all in the northeast. Um yeah. All the yeah. way down there, people are seeing that. I know that there's certain schools that'll take their kids out to see the yeah. the trucks go by, and I think it's a really cool event. It's really cool that you could go down there with the, the family and experience that. Was I don't know if was is the right word, but like, is it a moving experience to be part of it, or is there stuff going on in that ceremony that you think's moving at all, or whether it's the ceremony of the unknown soldier? I mean, what what are your thoughts around some of those things? Yeah. You know, there is there is a ceremony. We weren't at the ceremony, but they do some kind of a ceremony at Arlington. Mm -hmm. When we get in there, we to make sure that Milan can lay the wreath on Marcus Aurelius Goodrich, we kind of go like a beeline right there. Yeah. Right. And 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 you know, we we're probably, you know, I don't even know how many wreaths we hand out. There are so many wreaths there. I couldn't even I couldn't even tell you. If yeah. if anybody that's been to Arlington already knows it is such a surreal experience. Like just to see the amount of sacrifice that, mm -hmm. that this country has has had upon itself to to instill the, the way we live, you know, it's really humbling to walk in there. It, it really is. So we make a beeline there, but there is there is some sort of a process or procedure that they do to open up, you know, Reese Across America. Um, and then we kind of lay there and then we kind of 
we do a few more. We don't just do one. You get back in line. I mean, the lines are, you know, a couple hundred feet long. You wait in line. You get your Reese, you know, one per person until, like, you know, later on in the morning when they're trying to – because they want it all wrapped up by 10 and 10.30. It's not like they're getting oh, okay. along Okay, so this that. is quick. You get enough people yeah. that it's – we're going to bang this out in a couple hours. Two, two and a half hours. At the end, I, I think this year there were more Reese than, than headstones to lay them on because you can only put them on certain headstones based on – uh, the religious you know, beliefs, right? You don't yep. just put a wreath on any headstone if it's a certain religion, right? So mm-hmm. they, they, they tell you what to look out for. Don't put a wreath on this kind of headstone with yeah. this denomination. Put a wreath on this one. So by the end of the, you know, by, by 1030, Milan, Michelle, and I were walking around with wreaths, and we were actually struggling to find headstones to put them on. Yeah. Because there's just there's just so many people there doing that. But they like yeah, they like to have it wrapped up by about 10, 1030. It's, it's pretty much wrapped up. On a much smaller scale, I mean, you know that to be true at that St. Joseph's Cemetery where we live. Same thing. And there's certain yeah. things that were. It, I think in St. Joseph's the difference is that not everyone's a veteran, so you're looking for maybe like a, right. v, a V, a V. I a think. Flag. And that would, you're looking for a flag. There's oh. somebody that goes in there and marks them ahead of time with okay. flags. So you're at St. Flags, Joseph's, yeah. and then you put the wreaths. At Arlington, it's a little bit different. Where what 95 percent of people are are veterans, and maybe there's some spouses or oh, something too. More than that. Yeah, there's specific maybe, yeah. criteria. There's specific criteria to be buried at Arlington. Um, I was thinking yeah. with spouses too, but yeah, every there's any spouses that are even there are there with their veteran person. So yeah, it probably is a lot of a lot of wreaths. So love it, dude. Are you gonna go next year, or what do you think? We're Take a year off. About it. Yeah, we're already talking about it. Yeah. We, you know, there's always that. Well, this is what we do different next year. You know, do yeah. we drive down? Do we fly directly into DC? Last year we flew in. The, the whole reason for uh, driving this year, save aside from being a little bit more free to, you know, to go to the air and space in Virginia, yeah. to go to Mount Vernon. Now that we've already done that, I mean, I'd love to go see Mount Vernon again, but there's just still a lot in DC that we still haven't seen yet. You know, Ford's Theater was what was on the list to go to Ford's Theater. We didn't get get a chance to go there. You know, what I mean, there's still a is lot Ford's of Ford's Theater where Lincoln was assassinated. Correct. Yeah. Correct. No kidding. And you can go, you can go and see the the, the you know, you know, they have it all marked up, but you can see where Lincoln was assassinated. You know, so like that was one of the things we wanted to see. There's just a few other handful of things that, you know, like the, the Natural History Museum, right? We did that in two hours. I didn't even go to that this year. I got sick this year too. We can maybe touch upon that. I didn't do everything my family did this year. Yeah. Um, but like we did the Natural History Museum last year. Randy, you could probably spend three days in the Natural History Museum. We did it in three hours, right? So there's just a lot of things you can do mm-hmm. that that if you really want to take your time at DC, man, it's it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Um, you guys went to the top of the Washington Memorial. Yeah, we did. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I don't know anyone else that's ever done that. I think I might have told you that before, but there was a period of time where you weren't allowed to do that, and not that's everyone right. does it. Man, like that's pretty cool to say that you went to the top of that thing. That's right. They they had it off limits for a spell, maybe after nine eleven, and then in two thousand, some some historian is going to correct me. Maybe Joe Robinson, when he wants, is going to correct me. <laughs> but uh, I think in late two thousand ten, two thousand eleven, there was an earthquake in D.C. that the structure integrity of the monument was mm-hmm. was called into play. You could see when you go all the way up to the, the, the top, you can see some cracks in the stone mm-hmm. where it was repaired and buttressed and stuff like that. But one of the cool things that they don't tell you or you don't really you don't really realize until you're in some places like the smells. Right. Yeah. If I can equate the smell of being inside the, the Washington Monument all the way to the top, it's a damp basement. OK, and that's well, not about that. that's 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 when we went there because outside is, you know, it was 40, 45 degrees in D.C. at this time of the year. And then inside is conditioned space. And it's not insulated. It's stone. Like what, the, the stone you see on the outside is the stone you see on the inside. And it's all damp. And if you put your hands on it, it's damp. And they have these uh, humid, humid, uh, dehumidifiers all mm-hmm. set up all in there to kind of remove the dampness. Of course, when you add the human element in there all the time, you're raising the temperature, you know, by, just by people being in there, right? So. Mm-hmm. But like that's one of the things I couldn't like. It just smelled like a damp basement in there, like an old damp basement when you're okay. up at the top. There. But it's so cool. You get 360 views of Washington D.C. when you go up there. You see the Potomac. You can see the Pentagon. You can see mm-hmm. you know the Capitol Hill. You, you just turn. You know there's the Jefferson and so on and so forth. So um, and interesting enough, you have to either you can't just go up to the top on a whim. You either have to book a ticket out a few months in advance, which mm-hmm. Michelle was. Michelle was awesome. So, like, Mich- you know, you travel with my wife. She's got everything planned out, right? Yeah. And and not not in a rigid manner, but just like, 
we got, you know, we can't just do this on a whim. Like you can't just get a capital yeah. tour on a whim. You got to have some things a... planned and you fill in the gaps Correct. around those. But like, those are your yeah. things that you're building your day around. And this is one. Yeah, she had a legitimate like. agenda in place. This is what we're doing today. This is what we're doing there. And then like, cause we didn't know where we'd fall with the Washington monument. She got mm -hmm. four tickets four days in a row for us to go to the top. And it's only a dollar a ticket, right? So yeah. $4 to go to the top of the Washington monument. We ended up doing it right after our, white house tour i believe i'm thinking we did it right after our white house tour but she got those tickets like months in advance and if, if you don't get a month in advance then you have to like go online right at 10 of 10 p 10 a.m almost yeah. like a disney fast pass type of thing right where you're, where Which you're is doing not, that thing. that's not fun to have if there's no. any stress involved and you know especially yeah. if you really want to go and it's like the chance you might not get it so you never know yeah. what the demand really is on any given day but there's probably certain days that demand is high and maybe others that you know probably isn't really that big of a deal but is the washington monument the tallest thing in dc the wash correct yeah and it's also interesting though in fact the tallest stone made freestanding object in the world yeah taller than the pyramids not as not as much mass as the pyramids but taller but it's than, higher the pyramids. than the peak of the great pyramids Correct. It's 550 feet tall, and mm -hmm. when you're at that observation deck, and you're 500 feet over over the awesome. yeah, it's pretty cool. It is. That's cool. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad you did that. Last thing, DC wise, White House tour. How was that? that was I did cool. not think you could even do this anymore. First of all, like I thought they changed how these things work, and maybe they have, maybe it's back to being somewhat normal. But you were able to get in the White House. Yeah, you don't see the West Wing. You don't see any of this. You don't see any of that stuff. You see the state room. Yeah. You walk in through the East Wing, mm -hmm. uh, and so we almost didn't get in. This is one of those things where Michelle put in the request five or six months uh, before mm -hmm. we were going to go, and they give you the date ranges that you're going to be in DC to try to make it. So mm -hmm. of course she gave the, the day we were planning on going in. She gave us she gave them that date range, right? Mm -hmm. So we were planning on driving in on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday. Well, they gave us the time because they give you the day and time that you go. And mm -hmm. it's not negotiable, right? This is the time you show up. You're, you're in, right? Yeah. They do the whole background check, everything, right? You don't just walk into that White House, right? So they gave us Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the morning, which if we would have left like at midnight that night, we were planning on leaving really early in the morning anyway yeah. to go to D.C. But if we would have left at midnight, we would have come in after driving 10 hours, 10 and a half hours, going right there, not knowing where to park, not even situated, yeah. truck car full of luggage. So we decided to extend our stay and stay one more night. So mm -hmm. we went in the previous morning. So we made sure that we were fresh and, you know, yeah. we just wanted to be able to take in the experience of the White House without having to be driving for 10 hours. But okay. the White House was cool, all decorated for Christmas, surreal. You get mm -hmm. to see, you know, you get the iconic pictures that you just see, read about in books, you know, George Washington kind of standing there, Abraham Lincoln in the state room, just <laughs> portraits. It's really cool. Yeah. Portraits. Yeah. Real, uh, portraits. Awesome. So cool. Yeah. So much history. And, yeah. One of the other cool things, too, I'll touch upon, not, not to just make this hyper focused on DC, but when we did our capital tour, this is the second year we did our capital I tour. Bring this up too. I forgot that this happened. So I was going to, I was going to ask you about it, tell me about it, because I think it's freaking awesome. So last year, for anybody that wants a tour of their nation's capital, the, the Capitol building, reach out to you know one of your congressmen and one of your senators. We reached out to Angus King's office, second year in a row, no problem. We had a private Capitol tour because they have those group Capitol tours you can register for. But if you arrange one with your with your senator or congressman, then you get like an intern that's giving you a private Capitol. And tour. this is one of Angus King's interns that works. Correct. In Correct. His office. Yep. Yeah, and, and we got in on, like I said, we got in on a Tuesday, and last year when we went in, it was a lame duck session, so mm -hmm. it was like, you know, everybody's gone home, because you're right around the holidays, if they don't have yeah. anything really huge to talk about, then all the senators are going to go home, and then they'll vote on like non-important bills, right? Mm -hmm. This year, we got in there, and Zelensky, President Zelensky from Ukraine, was in town at the same time we were, so mm -hmm. he was obviously, um, you know, whatever he was, they had a meeting with Biden, and then they had a lot of congressmen talking about foreign aid to Ukraine, stuff like that. There was a, yeah. there was a bill on the floor for that. So like while we were in the Capitol tour, like Speaker of the House Mike Johnson walked by us, which was, Jesus, like, you know, just like, wow. That's, Third in line to be president right there. You know, just walking it's by. A, it. It's a working building, right? You're walking, you see that senator walk through. So I'm, I'm acting the intern. They said, well, how can you tell the difference between a senator and someone that just might be working in the building? And they have a special thing. They have, they, they have a pin that only senators get on their, on their lapel. So yeah. when they're walking through, that's how other people can know. Because 
you know, if you're security there, you, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess you could, you know, face a recognition of all of them, but there's one. Yeah. Like, uh, but, I mean, there's, I mean, there's some like I'm senators and four hundred. He's the senator of South like, Dakota. You know what I mean? If I was security there, I'd be like, I don't know, yeah. you know, like I'm sure yeah. they do, but never mind senators. But you, you think about just U.S. Congress people. But yeah. there's, you know, how many more of those are there? And you know, I, I, yeah. it's hard to keep track of all of them. So it makes sense that there's a system for that. So that was pretty cool. So what she did that we didn't even know that she was going to do, she got us four tickets to go in the Senate chambers um, uh, auditorium above, mm -hmm. the seating, yep. the stadium seating above where they actually sit and they talk and uh, about, uh, debate about passing the bills. So she mm -hmm. got us four tickets to that. So we got to see an active session of Congress sitting there mm -hmm. debating and talking and bills and stuff like that. It'd be really quiet, obviously, because everything's televised, but like you're just sitting there in the, in the, you know, the upper seats there looking over them talking about various bills. And one of the mm -hmm. ones they were talking about was colleges basically working like hedge funds, right? You know, are, are we subsidizing colleges too much with regards to, so, I mean, it was really interesting dialogue. We didn't mm -hmm. maybe stay for like 15 minutes because yeah. those things run forever. And it's so cool because I guess you don't see this on TV, but, it just, it's so weird. It seems like Washington, I hate to say this, is so self-serving, the, the senators that they're sitting there. They'll talk for their lot of time, and then they'll get up and walk out. They won't even yeah. listen to the rebuttal. They won't even listen to the other person, any other people speak. Yeah. So it's so weird, the dynamic. That's there. a whole other podcast. It's like a freaking, yeah. there's some weird stuff about that. It's a dog and pony show. Everyone kind of cares about themselves. It's just, just want to hear themselves talk and then, and then move on. You know, it's just yeah super fresh like anyways that that's an aside but you you probably got what you needed to out of that 15 minutes just to take the kids in there see what it is senate chambers and house chambers are two different things Correct. right yep. Yep. senate yep. chambers are a little smaller obviously less people house chamber yep. is where the state of the union addresses maybe don't see the senate chambers quite as much on tv for that reason but anyways awesome yeah yeah, it was cool. I mean, it was a bucket listing, scratched mm -hmm. off, you know, seeing how government works. Supreme Court building, that was cool to see. We did that this year, went mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. And then, like, I know, like, we're, we're dragging on about this. Philadelphia was surreal, too. You know, we stopped in Philly on the way back. You know, being in Independence Hall, being in the same room that, that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was signed, I, I like, that's literally where America started, right? Yeah. So, like, to kind of be there... It, for me, again, like a history guy, like that's awesome. You know, you know, um, you're able to get right in that room. You texted me a picture of the room. Yeah. And it's just, just yeah. awesome to be in there. I mean, they, 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 you ever see like the old courtrooms how they have those ballasts, those big wooden ballasts? Mm -hmm. Essentially, one side of it was a courtroom, the other side was a meeting room, but yep. they have those big ballasts, like almost like a courtroom would have that, you know, prevents you from going to where Separates George it. Washington yeah. was sitting when they were, you know, talking about certain things. And yeah, pretty cool. That's super cool. Awesome trip, man. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It seems like it'll be a weird pivot, but there's other things like there's things on my hit list that I want to, I want to talk to you about. And you mentioned one of them, like you said, while Michelle was driving you around, you were just on DraftKings the whole time making bets. <laughs> and I see your freaking bets coming on the app. It's there all hours of the day, all days of the week. <laughs> it seems like everyone's, everyone's making bets. Maine just legalized sports gambling. Uh, what, two months ago, month and a half ago. November, right? In November? Yeah, a couple months ago. So DraftKings is one of the two apps that you can use to bet. I want to talk about sports betting. What do you think about sports betting since it was legalized in the past couple months? Oh, Randy, can I just put us on pause real quick? Because I don't know if I have a connectivity issue, but I can't see you anymore. I can only hear you. You know, I can see you, so I can edit this part out. But I would say let's just okay. roll with it. As long as it's being recorded. It, yeah, is, okay. it, it so, is being recorded. Uh, what do I think of DraftKings? That's where we left off, right? Or what do you think about um, sports betting? Because I feel like it's taken over everyone's life, truthfully. I feel like it's everywhere. I feel like it's a topic of conversation. I feel like it's a topic of text groups. It's just like a more a thing than it ever has been with it now being legalized in Maine. I was just going to say, does it feel like that because it's legally new in Maine? Or have you felt like that for a while? Well, Sports betting has obviously been a thing. I feel like the NFL in general is like a league shaped by sports betting. And it's always been, you know, I was doing football cards when I was a kid. I mean, you know, hopefully the FBI doesn't come after me, but like we're doing football cards, you're doing survivor pools, you're doing, pit, you know, you, I feel like it's in our blood from when we we're children up until now, but it's, it's just different now. It's, 
it is so easy with the apps that they have. Like they're actually, it's ingenious, the apps they have and how easy it is to bet on all kinds of different things. It just seems like, even though it's always been a thing, people that maybe didn't actively gamble on sports before are now kind of pulled into that world. I agree, that. I agree with that. Here's the thing about sports betting. I feel like, you know, as a progression of what we've been able to do in Maine, like fantasy football was almost like the preclusion to, to sports betting, right? Except, you know, depending on what league you were, you're putting your buy-in and then it was a kind of either a winner take all or the funds, depending on how well you did, right? So that's like the long game of sports betting. So I feel like it naturally progressed for us to be, you know, I don't want to call it addicted to it, but definitely has our interest, right, with sports betting. And, and you know, particularly, I think there's only two in Maine you can use right now, Caesars or DraftKings. That, that'll that probably eventually change. Um, but, you know, I know I use DraftKings. And, look, it's, it's entertaining. It does make the game fun. Mm-hmm. It does tend to make me watch things that I necessarily wouldn't watch if I wanted to put a little bet on it or not. Like, I bet on the Celtics the other day. Would have never watched the Celtics. guy now. Huge Big, all in. next week. Yeah. Get, oh yeah. <laughs> gonna get you a Tatum jersey or a Porzingis jersey. I already got I already got two. You know, I got the green one and the white one. So not even a big deal really. Or the black one. They don't use the green one in the tier. They, I, I so big guy, you know, big Celtics guy though. Yeah. So but I think look, I was thinking about this earlier today. When you win a bet, it makes you feel like a genius. Yep. When you lose a bet. You blame it on the players, right? You don't, you don't think they kind of know. It's like, I'm an idiot for thinking that. It's like, oh, why couldn't he just catch one more ball, right? So it's I know. like, it's, it's funny. so funny that you say that because it do, it feels good to win a bet. Like I, so, I won something that had I think plus six hundred was like a three three pick parlay had like plus six hundred odds. Nothing crazy, but like felt awesome. I was like, yeah, man, I know what I'm talking about. And then there's this thing of like everyone that's been gambling, again, because I feel like everyone I know is gambling. You hear about all the wins, but you don't necessarily hear about the losses because we were talking offline before and you're like, oh, yeah, DraftKings is killing me. I'm like, really? It seems like all I hear is like these awesome bets that you hit. And I guess it's just natural. It's, I mean, every, we all do it. Yeah, but uh, we're probably losing money more than winning. So I downloaded, I downloaded an app that keeps track of all my DraftKings activity. So I know if I'm up for the year down. For the year. Yep. Yeah, it, it integrates with the app. It pulls data from DraftKings. You gotta use your login, your credentials, and it pulls it. So I know I'm up for the year, right? So I know I'm, I'm not, I'm not like losing money head over. You know, I'm, I'm actually up like a couple hundred bucks for the year, right? But I've hit a few big hits. But then what I was telling you earlier, like I, I think I've been mush for the last week. You know, I haven't, I haven't hit anything. I came really close to hitting some really good payouts this mm-hmm. weekend. And you know, it, it just takes one thing to happen, right? So this weekend in particular, right? This last, this last past weekend, week 18 for the for football. I feel like that was such a loaded gun because there were some teams that didn't even need to play their stars. Some teams pulled their stars second half of the game. Some stars it's never tough. went it's in. It's a week for that stuff. Some teams aren't playing for anything, like the 49ers. They already locked up number one seed. Same thing with the Ravens. Lamar Jackson was inactive. So then it's like, okay, now you're trying to distinguish between who do I bet on, who's playing for something, who isn't. Mm-hmm. And I followed the NFL as close as the next guy, but I'm not in the weeds with it, right? Mm-hmm. Like So you got to really be in the weeds for some of these – parlay problems mm-hmm. you know does this guy need to hit this for incentives for a contract payout will that team let him hit it because yeah. they don't want to pay out that incentive right that's so- next level strategizing for the gambling side of things and honestly that's kind of why i have stopped i guess i haven't stopped i do do a couple things but like i feel like if i want to do it i want to like really do it and be yeah. good at it and like know the intricacies and know the smart bets to make and the, and avoid the dumb bets. And it's like, I'm not at that point where I am able to dedicate like the brain power yeah. to like really figuring this out and doing the things that you said. So and instead I've backed away. And I don't um, do that either. I don't do that either. Baseball. Like I'm, I'm actually pretty excited for the baseball season to come up because baseball is probably the one sport that I could, that I probably have a fighting chance at doing pretty well at with regards yeah. with knowledge and prospects yeah. and knowing, you know, does this pitcher pitch well against this team? Does this team hit well against lefties? Yeah. You know, um, yeah. so stuff like that. But, but football is just, it's just fun, you know? Crazy. And the fact that it makes Sundays way better or whatever day the, the games are on. A thousand percent. Yeah. Thousand percent. Because it's, and, and one of the things I do like about betting on football is I might touch a Thursday night game. I might mm-hmm. touch a Monday night game. Like you said, Sunday. So the fact that it's only once a week, 
You can't get into mm-hmm. trouble for like the whole week. Yeah. You know, like, you know, and one of the things too, is they tell you is don't chase it, right? If, if you're down, just stop chasing it. It should be fun. The second, like mm-hmm. you're looking at it as income or you, or you need this to rebound, then all of a sudden yeah. it's a defeated it's purpose. It's something different you're into altogether right there. So yeah. one thing I feel like I've noticed too, since this became more of a thing is people gravitating towards long shot type bets. You know, a lot of, a lot of big parlays, a lot of like, plus 600, 800, 1100 people that gamble will know what I'm talking about. Like, I just feel like that's what people are talking about. And people might be just be doing money lines on a single game or like two, two, you know, two thing, two game parlays or something like that. But it just feels like the ease of the app draws people into doing like multiple things that compounds the riskiness of them. I don't know if that's true or not. It just, it seems like that's all that people talk about. It's a thousand percent true because you're like, well, what? That's the what if scenario, right? Like, if I go buy a lottery ticket, like, if lottery wasn't successful, the what if happens if I hit it, right? Yeah. So the biggest one I hit this year was a plus fifty six hundred. So like fifty six to one. If you're not a gambler to listening to this, that's like a that's huge. Yeah. What would you a five dollar bet and win like thousand bucks or something? Uh, I, 50, I was fifty six to one. I put ten dollars on and I won five hundred sixty. Okay. Right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So so that was pretty good. But, you know, I you know, obviously denominations are going to differ for comfort level with the wagering money, right? But you're not going to do $100 the on a 56 to 1. I mean, no, maybe but that's why you just like to look at the odds, right? Like, mm-hmm. so it's like you hit – the odds are more the bragging right than the, than the money you won. Like, I put yeah. something together that was yeah, 56 that to 1. Yeah, you were smart enough to put together something that hit 56. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you yeah. know your shit enough that you would win a bet that had 56 to 1 odds. Yeah, you're right. That is a badge of honor. So and then, that's probably and the best one that hit, I've heard. Have you heard of anyone else out of our friends that have gotten better than that? I almost hit two more this weekend and something needed to align that didn't happen. So I haven't heard of anybody hitting anything like bigger. that. Yeah. But there are there have been big hits with mm-hmm. with bigger like amounts wagered. But I, yeah. I know people that have hit, you know, ten to ones, twelve yeah. to ones. Which you know, is I've good. hit a few twelve to ones, yeah. Yeah. So it's really interesting though, like just doing a money line on a single game doesn't move the needle for me. It's almost like, why even bother betting if I'm just going to pick the money line on a certain game, you know, or the, or just the under on a certain game? I know people do it, and historically that's a thing, but it just seems like in this world now of the app and, you know, risk versus reward, it seems like it's only fun to me personally if I'm doing yeah. something that's like a low probability chance to win, and then I end up losing it because obviously there's a low probability chance that you win, and then I end up having no money, and it's just a big freaking waste. Well, so that's what, so you hit on a few points there. There's the better that likes to have money riding on the game for the outcome, right? Like, yeah. you know, you play the money line, you play the over-under, you parlay those together, maybe you play them independent, that's fine. What I, what I like about it is putting together a parlay where you're tracking the stats real life in the game, almost like you would mm-hmm. in fantasy football. How's mm-hmm. my team doing this week? How, how's my bet doing this week? Because I, I yeah. think, you know, Jamar Chase is going to go for more than 80 yards. I think that Josh Allen is going to pass for more than 300. Yeah. And for me, the fun is, is when you're watching Sunday night, or Sunday morning, Sunday games, Sunday night games, afternoon games, and you have the you have the app open, and you kind of see, like, progression. Like, go a little <laughs> further, a little further. Hey, man, I and, know exactly. There is something about that, like, in our soul that we like to see the, the, the tracking, the progression. I did a, I think we were texting about a 12-person anytime touchdown. Yeah, Parlay yeah. for ridiculous odds. It was it was five dollar bet to win fifteen thousand bucks or something like yeah. that. It would have been ridiculous. But there was a guy that I think did what a sixteen person anytime touchdown parlay, or he he bet five dollars and won like four hundred thousand yeah, dollars because yeah, yeah. he had this laundry list of people that had to score touchdowns in one day, and they did. So I'm like, ah, screw it, five bucks. I'll throw this in there. And like the first game, someone hit it. Second game, someone hit it. And you start being like, oh, this is. And you look at the app, and there's dots next to the people that scored. Obviously, I didn't win, but it was fun. I enjoyed. It was five dollars well spent to be able to like follow. Well, we were talking way. about it in a text string, right? You had that huge one, then I had one, and then and then our friend Joel piggybacked yeah. on mine. So then when we saw yeah. Jonathan Taylor score, now we had three out of the four, and we just needed mm-hmm. C.J. Stroud to get in. So you're just like, it, it's it brings a level of excitement, like you said, five dollars, ten dollars well spent yeah. that otherwise you don't have talking mm-hmm. with these guys. Like who cares if C.J. Stroud scores? Yeah. Well, I do now, and now Joel yeah. does too, and then you know, so it's cool. What a genius move by these apps to create these groups. Cause what we're talking about is a betting group. Like we can be, there's almost like a Facebook aspect to these betting apps where you have like friends on DraftKings. You create a group. When you make a bet, you, everyone in that group sees that bet. And then if you make a bet and you text us and you're like, I made this bet I like, you can go in there and piggyback it. Like you said, make the exact same bet at the click of a button. 
And it's freaking genius. You know what I mean? Like, so you said Joel piggybacked you. Joel wouldn't have made that bet. DraftKings wouldn't have had his money if they didn't create this I, group. It, and it's just like a genius thing. And I that's do like really seeing like other I do like seeing other people's bets, and that's the genius behind it. Because like, if you've ever sat there and tried to put together a bet for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can do a single game parlay. Obviously, for those people that don't know what a parlay is, you're picking a series of events or player props to to work out the way that you're that you're predicting them to, right? So, mm -hmm. like, if I want, you know, if I predict the money line for the Patriots, that means I'm saying the Patriots are going to win the game outright yeah. without the spread yeah. involved. And then if I pick the over under in the same bet, that's a parlay that they're either going to be over the number of points that are stated or under the amount of points that are stated, right? Yeah. So the genius of it is. Unless I'm picking a, unless I'm building a single game parlay, it's actually quite cumbersome to look at all the different games. Of like, okay, in that Bengals Browns game, I want Jamar to hit 80 yards, but then let's go to the Eagles uh, Giants game, and I want Jalen Hurts to pass for 150. So it's yeah. like there's a lot of effort in that. So the genius of looking at betting groups, and you can also see betting groups that you don't belong to, like popular bets, and you go there like, yeah. wow, that guy put something together that I think, or that girl might put something together that I think might hit. And it's like, I don't want to call it a laziness thing, but it's like, it gives you way more options to be able to look at something that say, that's something along the lines I put together. I like it. Let's go, you know, type yep. of thing. So, yep. Um, so you mentioned before, there's two groups right now that allow betting in Maine, DraftKings and Caesars, right? Caesars Palace, I think is the other one. Yeah, Caesars app. Yep. But, but there are other apps, FanDuel, Fanatics. There's yep. a million other apps. Yep. I almost feel like it's impossible to break through now that those those two have established like i can't see a scenario that i like pivot from DraftKings at this point because everyone i know is on DraftKings, and that's what i use i mean they would have to have some serious promotions but what a failure on those other companies parts to do what they I'm need to ready. do to be to be ready day one in maine because it's it, you know it's like DraftKings to me is sports betting at this point in maine you know it's almost like like it's when the the company becomes the 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 thing, like Band Aid or something like that. Like Coke, Coca Cola, right? First yeah. one that gets market share dominates yeah. market share usually afterwards, right? But we talked about yeah. earlier, and I'm sure one of your listeners will know and maybe could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the app or the or the institution itself has to have some kind of ties with something that's physically in the state, right? Yeah. So like, let's say you're one of them that's partnered with Oxford Casino, right? That has a gambling license. You need to. You need to be partnered with somebody that has a gaming license in that state. And I just don't think there's too many in the state of Maine yeah. that have gaming licenses where you could have that carte blanche to have like fan duels and fanatics and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're maybe like, you know, DK, DraftKings and Caesars Palace have the wherewithal to like lock that up, like maybe get into contracts with, mm -hmm. you know, entities that have gaming licenses in the state of Maine. And I can't imagine there's too many. That have mm -hmm. a, that, I mean, and that's probably true. And I, it's probably as simple as that, but well done by them. I'm surprised by Caesars too, because I don't equate Caesars with a sports betting. I mean, obviously I equate Caesars with a, being a casino and Las Vegas and all that stuff, but I don't equate it with like an app and betting they on football. They got a pretty good sports book. They got a pretty good yeah. sports book out in Vegas. Yeah. I bet Apparently, you've been Caesars, they have their stuff right? together enough to, to yeah. take what they're doing in Vegas and make it a, an app that's at least what now amazing. I will say while I was in Washington, D.C., I did download FanDuel just to see the experience there. And I, you know, I got to say, I didn't hate it. Like yeah. FanDuel, yeah, FanDuel was, it was, it was on par with DK. It's just a So my event. brother, so I put those two as neck and neck. Like in my mind, FanDuel and DraftKings yeah. are like Coke and Pepsi or just whatever. They're just, the, they're equals. In mass, my, my brother uses FanDuel and he loves it. He swears by it. So I would probably like it too, if that was the case, but okay. we don't have the option. One of the things I was doing though, Randy, when I had FanDuel app open in DC and I had DraftKings app, I was looking at, because each app are going to develop their own odds, right? They have their own algorithms working. And, and yeah. at the end of the day, you know, Vegas is setting a lot of the lines, right? But then these apps or these institutions, they can set their own lines and they can give their own odds for payouts too, right? So I did feel when I was comparing apples to apples on certain bets that DraftKings odds of, were better than FanDuel's. Slept. Interesting. Yeah. They paid out. Like, like, I would look at the money line for this game, money line for that game, and DraftKings was paying out more on the money lines, I would say, 75% of the time. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting to hear. I, I mean, it makes sense, but I'm not surprised. So, okay. Love the, love the sports betting. Big game tonight. In college football, so this will come out next week, and the college champion will be crowned. But what are your thoughts on the game tonight? 
I haven't given much thought to it at all. I'm not a big college football guy. I don't have any. I don't have any action on it, so to speak. What is it? It's Michigan and Michigan, Washington. Have not looked at the odds. I just wasn't yeah. sure if you were going to get sucked in and place a bet. I will not place a bet on it, although oh. I will watch. I will no, watch I, the game. Will you even watch it? Yeah, I, I will watch it. I will. Interesting note fact: I have never won a bet on college football, so I'm not going to bet. <laughs> Betting on college football. Dude, I don't know anything about college football. Like, I really don't. Like, there's some people that live and die college football. It's just really not my thing. So, I, no, you know, I mean, right? it's tough because, you know, you're following players. You don't know half of them are, I don't know, say half of them, you know, 90% of them make it to the pros. So, you know, you're not hear, yeah, maybe even more, maybe not generous. But, yeah, I mean, I watched that Michigan Alabama game. I thought that was a great game, honestly. And I watched tonight's game. You know, was it at eight o'clock? kickoff or usually prime time right yeah 735 tonight michigan's favored by five against washington so really? i personally would like michigan to win for whatever reason i don't know why i mean maybe because tom brady went there el prez went there i don't know jim harbaugh is there i don't know like i, I guess I'm, I'm a, i guess i'm drawn towards them or do you not even care i'm not a big harbaugh guy i honestly wanted alabama to beat michigan to be honest with you really uh big saving guy I, I, yeah, yeah, honestly, I am a big saving guy. A lot of good talent he has. I think he's got a good program over there. A lot of people said Alabama shouldn't have even been in that game. Georgia, was it Georgia that got kind of – Yeah, but, they uh, beat, but Alabama beat Georgia in the SEC championship, so it's like how could you not have Alabama in? Yeah. But they, they gave – either way, they gave Michigan a good game, and they definitely deserve to be there. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But so I, I watch it today. I will, I will not lay any action on it. Oh. No action. No action. Um, I think Washington has that kid. Is it Penix? I don't know if that name rings a bell to you. He's a decent quarterback, but might be more of a end of the first round, top of the second round kind of guy. Is anybody so coming I, out? Is anybody coming out in this game? Like him, the, the him. He's, the, he's the guy. Okay. He, he might be like the, the fourth or fifth best quarterback in the draft, but he will catch my eye, and I will be watching. He's a lefty. Oh, because okay. I'm, I'm interested to see what the Pats do in the in the draft next year. Part of me wants them to take Marvin Harrison Jr get a freaking stud wide receiver. That's like, it's so important to have a good receiver. It's obviously very important to have a quarterback in this league, but I feel like the, the best wide receivers are like more of a short thing than the best quarterbacks are. I feel like even the number one draft pick is maybe at best a 50, 50 chance of actually being a successful um, player yeah. in the league. So part of me thinks get the sure, sure thing wide receiver and then get a coin flip top of the second round with a guy like this as quarterback. That's probably not what they're going to do, but I will be watching the game well, so with that kind of mind. Let's pick. Let's peek into this a little bit. Patriots just secured the third overall yeah. pick, right? Washington's got two, and then the Bears got number one with Carolina's trade pick, right? So yeah. the Bear is an interesting question. Are they going to take a quarterback, or are they going to as Fields their guy? If I was them, I would take a quarterback because Fields doesn't do it for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. He just. I don't know that he has the arm and that, that passing side of things, which is so important, obviously has the legs, but that stuff disappears and disappears quick. I mean, look at guys like Russell Wilson. So when it goes, it goes, but I feel like Justin Fields played the well enough the past few weeks, months that Chicago fans and then like the people on TV want him to be the quarterback. So then there's the talk of if they're going to keep him as a quarterback, it makes sense for them to trade out of that spot, move down, even if it's, you know, four or five, and get some pieces and you know so like i don't think they end up taking a quarterback but i think someone will take a quarterback with that first pick it's well, just whether some, or not there's, there's, someone what, else. there's caleb williams there's drake may there's a couple big names that are going to go high quarterbacks right Those are but two of the big like, ones. yep but then you're like okay now justin fields was a top five quarterback mm -hmm. wasn't he trey lance was number one wasn't he or was just like yeah that fields might have been five or six yeah. So, like, they already have a first round talent, you know, or, or, you know, you would think. So, how many years do you give them? How long of a leap do you give them? Right. This was the draft class after Mac Jones or before Mac Jones, Justin Fields. I think he was the draft class before Mac Jones, right? Yeah. One before. Yeah. So, he's been there for three years now. Mm -hmm. Is he the guy? Right. So, but Trubisky was playing before, too. What, didn't he play? Didn't Justin Fields not go out right away? So, this is like his second playing year or so, so much and so forth. So, I don't know. I, I, if I'm the Bears, why don't you look at Marvin Harrison Jr. With, yeah. with number one? Because if you really think Justin Fields is your guy, Harrison's not going in the second round. If you want a top wide out, because they've got Cole Komet, decent, decent tight end, they've got a DJ Moore. Good, good talent. I mean, imagine Harrison Moore won too. 
That would be yeah. that, you know, no excuses. So I just that don't point. think that you need to do that. I, I think the better move for them is, yeah. is to trade down, whoever that yeah. is. Even if it's the Pats, if the Pats are really, it's not a Pats move really to trade up, but like someone like them in that three, four, five range that does need a quarterback, you can get an extra second round draft pick or get something else and still get Marvin Harrison. I just, I'd be surprised if Mar- Marvin Harrison went first, but he'll go I top five. He's, he'll go top yeah, five. He'll definitely go top so, five. So yeah, that's we'll love to have the Pats get him. Let's touch, let's touch on this real quick because while we're in the football, while we're in the draft picks, while we're talking about New England, A, is Belichick our head coach next year? B, if he is, is he relieved of his GM responsibilities? Because I think one thing that's evident, and again, there's going to be comments from the gallery, but I think Belichick's a heck of a good coach. I think we saw defensively what that team can do, above average defense, right? And I think if we just had an average offense, we would have sniffed the playoffs this year. Totally. Right. And if we had Judon and Gonzalez, like we have a good defense, even the way that it is now, never mind if we had two of our best players also on the team. I mean, Belichick's a good coach. There's no question. He's a good coach. He, he's, right? still and good he's, coach. he's always been a defensive minded coach, right? Yeah. And and the years we had good offenses, it wasn't his offense. You know, I mean, yeah. when you have the great Tom Brady on the on on the field, you know, for a majority of your career, you have it's like you have two offensive coordinators in one. Because there's nobody mm-hmm. that runs defenses better than Tom Brady. There's nobody that did progressions better than Tom Brady, the timing routes, all that stuff, right? So he knew what's happening in real time. And then he could go over with McDaniels or whoever was the offensive coordinator at that time, and they could talk about what's happening in real time, what's going on there, and make adjustments. Yeah. If you don't have that level of quarterback under center, then that all weighs on the offensive coordinator out there to make yeah. those adjustments. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so Belichick, I don't think is great for building a team, and I and, and I think he needs a better offensive minded coordinator there, and obviously more to, more talent, more tools, right. It's indisputable that he can't put together a team anymore. The last five or six years of drafts are a freaking absolute nightmare from any metric. I hate to say it because I love the guy. Like, I will ride for Belichick forever. I mean, that guy, him and Brady, those guys have given me so many good football memories and life memories. But, like, there are so many people that we missed on in these drafts. And you can see it in our team going four and whatever we were. What is it? Four and that yeah. shit. What are we? You mean we could have DK Metcalf? Really? Yeah. We could, we could, <laughs> instead of Nikhil yeah. Harry, we could have DK Metcalf, you know? It's I think like, AJ oh, Brown, too. I mean, yeah. just the, the list really goes on, you know, taking that kicker and what, the fourth round? Like, there's just a lot of misses. So here's my thought on the Belichick thing, and I'd be interested to hear yours because I put out this poll on Instagram yesterday. You might have saw it. Honestly, like 50 people freaking respond to it with yes or no's. I do think that we're done with Belichick this year because I think it's clear that someone else needs to pick the team. And if he was okay coaching it, then, like, I would be okay with that. I don't want him to not be the coach, but I do need him to give relieve that power of picking the team. I just don't know if someone like him can relieve power. And even if he says he can relieve, like, give up that power, is the person that's picking the team really not, like, caving into what he – like, is there really, like, a strong enough person anywhere in football that can come in here as the GM of the Pats and truly oh. pick the team without Belichick's input onto it? So does so that's another question. I don't know if Scott Pioli is coming back, you know, because he is was that a the thing? Last... Is that even I don't on know. The table? I, I, that's what I'm saying. So the funny thing is, is when this airs, it'll probably all be resolved by then. Well, we'll I, today today it's, it's today's Monday after the the season just ended. Yeah, it so, could be in the next day or so that we find out what's going on. But this, the funny thing you say this, and this will all be looked at in hindsight, 2020. But Belichick just had a presser this morning. I don't know if you watched that. There were questions that were asked to him, and one of the questions was, "Would you stay on as coach, but relieved of your of your operations title?" And his answer was not a no. His answer was, "I will do whatever's best for the team if we all can come to the agreement that that's what's best for the team." So it's kind of a cryptic way of saying, "Yeah, I would if you know if, if the solution." For for the GM is somebody better than me, right? And Belichick's got a high opinion of himself with football knowledge. There's probably nobody on the planet that knows more about football than Bill Belichick. But he'd mm-hmm. have to respect the person that they are thinking of making the GM, right? Yeah. And I think that he's not just going to blindly say, yes, there's an open spot. Let's fill in the GM. He'd probably want a very strong voice on who the person is they're going to hire, right? So it's it's not going to come without strings if that is a scenario, right? If he, So if that's... A thing, and he has to basically rubber stamp whoever they put there. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know. Think it'd be a, I don't think it'd be a rubber stamp, right? Because a rubber stamp is just like anybody. Be okay with it. You know, he, there's no scenario where he has to 
accept someone that he's not picking, right? Like, otherwise well, he, he would just leave. Away. Yeah, because he walks that's, away. That's if, he it means. if he doesn't like the vision of the team, the GM they put in there, I think he's okay with parting ways with 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 the, with the facility with the organization, right? Because how did it come to be where he ended up taking on this role? They fired Scott Pioli, or he didn't, and then Belichick's like, okay, I can do this from now on, type of thing, right? Was it you Nick? Know? Was it Nick Cesario too? Who's the guy that's down the Texans now? I mean, better to be you- a perfect person to add on to this pod because you would know that, but yeah, yeah, he would know that. So yeah, there there have been some people that were involved in personnel, but I think Ernie Adams was involved in personnel, and when he moved on, that kind of left a void. So it might have just like fallen on his lap. And I think it did. Never... I, I, yeah. I I remember waking up one day and just like I guess Belichick's our GM now. Like I didn't feel like mm-hmm. there was a big announcement. I didn't feel like there was this big like active hiring process, and they find out he was the right person for the job. Like you said, I think it just kind of fell into his lap, you know. Mm-hmm. And they obviously restructured this contract extension around that. Now that's another thing to talk about too is if Bell that these are all like the X's and O's of the negotiation because it's not just as quick as I mean, I guarantee he's already met with Robert Kraft or he's meeting with him right now as we're recording this because the meeting was yeah. scheduled for today, right? So it's like Some now people made it seem like this was done weeks ago though too. Like I'm sure there's been a dialogue. Uh, you never know what's going on behind the scenes over there, but. If he was fired, he'd be fired by now, I think. There's a lot of intricacies with this. That He's the longest tenured head coach in the league. Mike Tomlin's only the second one that's been with the team as long, right? And this is his worst season. And it's not as simple as, like, you know, there's been three firings already this year, already today, right? Carolina head coach, Washington head coach, and then there's – is there someone else really? that's fired too? That, I have yeah, not seen that yet, but I, those were expected. Those are expected. And honestly, I, I, I can't see uh, – his name is escaping me right now. The coach for the Eagles. They go one and done in the playoffs. He's not sticking around either. That team yeah. is imploding right now. So, <laughs> But I, I don't think it's as clear cut because if he was fired, they, they would have already released the information already, right? Because there's been speculation whirlwinding around this since, begin, since midseason, right? Did, did Belichick hold on to Mac Jones for so long? But Belichick might have known something we didn't do because Bailey Zappi is not an NFL quarterback. Right, no. you know, he he'll be playing on the practice squad somewhere next year. Maybe not even New England. Mac He's Jones will be on someone. Mac Jones will be somebody's backup next year, right? Yeah. Mac Jones is not our starting quarterback. Either we release him or we keep him as our backup. We are definitely. He uh, can't be on the team anymore. Mac Jones. He's, not, he's I mean, emotionally broken, right? He is broken. Yeah. yeah he needs a new. Him. He needs a new scenario. Yeah. So we got to go on free agency, or an undrafted, or draft two quarterbacks. But you need a veteran. I would love to see us go up to Kirk Cousins, sign him to a two, three year deal. Cousins. Yeah, sign him to a two, three year deal. We draft a quarterback that can go under his journeyman, that can, that, that Kirk Cousins can mentor. Because Kirk Cousins is one of the last true pocket passers in our league, I think. He's you good. Know? Kirk Cousins is good. Dude, being quarterback is hard. There's not that many good quarterbacks. It's like you get to. 12 or 13 in the league like that's what you get to work with there's probably like 13 competent quarterbacks and obviously there's a top tier of that, that. But like which you is that too much you think i'd say that list yeah. is half tangway jason tangway and i were talking about this saturday or, or friday saturday and i think it's less than i think it's five i think there's yeah. actual five quarterbacks that can confidently pay, play the decision to confidently play the position reading defenses doing proper progressions check downs knowing the playbook and, you know, like at the top of that list is Pat Mahomes, right? I mean, I think he is head, head and shoulders the best quarterback in the league. And, no. you know, he's, he's got no support around him, right? I mean, you look at the stats, the, the, the Chiefs are the number one team in drop passes, right? So he's putting it in their hands and they're not holding on to it, right? And then I think you've got, like, your Joe Burrows, you know? You're, 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 they're on Joe the, Burrows. A healthy Joe Burrow is a good quarterback. Yeah. And then some people would say, like, Lamar Jackson. I, I don't call Lamar Jackson a true pocket passer. He has gotten yeah. so much better at it this year. I will say, you watch him; it's exciting. What he can do in the pocket, he rifles it out. They win because he's always the best athlete, best athlete on the field, right? Yeah. And when when the pass isn't there, that boom, he runs. He can run off. I mean, he, he can win the game with his legs too. But what was the last quarterback that you felt was a Super Bowl contender that had that kind of game, right? That that you had to fear him as a runner. As well as a passer, and it's not Michael Vick, because but you, 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 he was never going to go anywhere, right? I mean, they were never going to win the whole thing because you know if you force him to run, he was dynamic to watch, but yeah, they never they never actually. Never, yeah, he had a good arm, but okay. So 
Then you go back, right? Steve Young, maybe, but he yeah. didn't really. He rushed when he's he had not as dynamic was, as Lamar Jackson is. Yeah, you know, so it's like, who's like uh, the Ravens already have? Well, Lamar doesn't have a ring yet. The Ravens have one under uh, Bob, but Lamar doesn't, right? So, yeah. has there been a quarterback that has won? I mean, do you, do you consider Patrick Mahomes a rushing quarterback? I think he well, runs. A, and he has. That's to. a great question because I. Don't, but he is really good running, man. He made yeah. some runs last year with that ankle situation where I was like, this guy's unbelievable. Really won me over as a football fan. Like, I actually really like Patrick Mahomes now. Just what gutsy playoff performance, Super Bowl performance he had last year. So, no, he's not the type of runner that Lamar is, but he's better than most. I mean, who's better than him, truthfully? Um, Lamar, like Josh Jay, Allen. Jalen Hurts, but Jalen Hurts, I think we're kind of seeing what he is really about, right? So, and even that he doesn't run as like you might put Jalen Hurts in the same category as Lamar or maybe those guys, but like he's not. He's not. You know, you might you might even think of that with someone like Tua. He's not. You know, Tua Tua does not run anymore because of the concussions. Yeah. Tua used to be the type that would pull it down and then run. And I think they basically scrapped that. Like did you're you, a concussion away from being out of the league. Did you hear that in the off season Tua had like martial arts training and it was like how to take a fall? Yeah to avoid concussions. And I thought it was a joke. I thought it was laughable. I'm like, you're freaking shitting me. You got to be kidding me that he did this. And I would have bet any amount of money, and this is why I'm a bad gambler, that he did not finish the season. And the guy freaking did it, man. He did actually, he did remove that part of his game from the equation, but he was able to stay in there. And obviously Miami lost last night and they're a wild card team now, but good for him so for staying on the field. Let me ask you another question. Where do you rate Josh out? Because from my perspective, People saying Josh Allen's a top five quarterback. I go, look, yeah, he won for the game, for the team last last night, right? But two picks. So part of he's part of the problem too because he's not a game manager. He tried, like you know, he's a he's another version of Brett Favre. He's another. I was just gonna say he's the of, perfect of example Bledsoe. of Brett Favre. He's yeah. a legitimate gunslinger that tries to do too much and and he gets his team in trouble with, with turnovers, right? So he's a turnover um, machine. But he's, it's undeniable he's a good talent. And that's, he's another one, too. When he needs to rush, he does rush, right? So mm -hmm. he can pull it down, and he can go out and get 10, 12, 15 yards when they need it, right? But I wouldn't say he's a Lamar Jackson type, you know? Lamar Jackson really isn't a class of his own when he's running. But he, he's an anomaly. It, with the eyeball test, number one, when you see him run, you're like, holy shit. But also, like, the stats that he has. He has, yeah. like, some rushing stats as a, as a quarterback that are untouchable. and. You know, in certain situations, he's been on par with different running backs throughout the year. So he really is in a league of his own when it comes to running quarterbacks. And then everyone else's guys, just like Josh Allen, maybe Daniel Jones. But can uh, they win it? Mahomes, you know. Honestly, as we're talking about these quarterbacks, I don't even know the top five. It's probably Mahomes, Burrow, Lamar, just by default. I mean, I know people want to put Purdy in there because the team's good. He's probably not a top five QB. Jalen Hurts had flashes earlier this year when everyone thought he was going to win the MVP. I mean, I don't even know beyond look, that who's like top You guys. look at Brock Purdy, very impressed with his year other than when he played against the Ravens and the Ravens made him look like they they were like a junior varsity team, right? Yeah. Like MVP candidate versus MVP candidate and Lamar came out of that way on top than Brock Purdy. Mm -hmm. But other than that, he's he's a pocket passer. I mean, he can roll out a bit when he needs yards, but I mean, when you have the best player or arguably the best player in the league, C Mac, you know, on your team, mm -hmm. and then he's got a receiving core. Let's face it, you got Debo Samuel, you've got Kittle, Ayuk. you've got Brandon Ayuk. I mean, he's got some great. They have a championship football team, and then the moves mm -hmm. they made to solidify their defense this year too. It is going to be a Ravens 49ers Super Bowl, I think, this year. It really is going to be. Those teams seem to be. Much further than the next best team. I don't even know who the second best team in the NFC is anymore. The Cowboys, right? So Cowboys probably. So let's predict the AFC championship game then. Because I, I I think we are going to have a Ravens 49ers. So let's predict NFC and AFC championship game then. Who's I'd say Buffalo play? versus the Ravens, which would be a great game. That, yeah, because. I don't I, think KC gets there. I don't think Miami gets there. I think everyone else is kind of just lucky to get in the playoffs, truthfully. I think Miami goes into Kansas City next week and beats them. Yeah. I, I think Very Miami good. beats KC at KC because KC just won last yesterday by a point. Yeah. You know? They're they're a shell of their former selves. They need some serious like, you know, 
There's never been a tight end that's like Kelsey, great tight end, had a worst year of his career. And he's, did he did he hit the threshold? Did he hit did he jump the shark? Or was this just a bad year? So he's old, man. You know, I know a lot of people wanna wanna blame my girl T Swift, but he's like 34. That's old <laughs> to be a tight end. Like these guys, that's not a position that plays till 45 like Brady. And I think now is around the time where those type of people would start breaking down. So I mean he's had a freaking great career. And Kelsey's um, not a great blocking tight end. So he's just been a receiving tight end. Yeah. Did he get the thousand yards yesterday? I didn't see that. I didn't watch the game. I didn't watch the game. Yeah, I know he was wow. not that far off from a thousand. It would have been his eighth thousand yard season. It wasn't and a it would have been scoring a scoring game, so I don't know that he that he had that opportunity. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean they have no other weapons, so you, you know. They're, they're, no, they're they're I don't think they make it past next week either. So then who do you have then in the AFC championship? I I have the Dolphins playing the Ravens in the AFC Championship game. I think the right. Dolphins, I think they learned from their mistakes with the Bills. Because, of course, the Bills had some freak plays to be able to beat the Dolphins. They had the mm-hmm. kickoff return, right? They had the tip. They had the they had the pass that was tipped at the line that the, that the, that the receiver yeah. caught in the back of the end zone. Those, to me, are an anomaly plays that, yes, yeah, special teams win championships, right? But you had to have the aligning of the stars for the Bills to win that game, I think. Right. I thought Miami was the better team out there defensively, and this things, a couple things went against them that cost them that game. Right. So and that might not go against them. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Next time. The fact they didn't get any points at that. The fact that Buffalo didn't get any points going into halftime. I don't know if you saw that where guy got tackled the one yard line. Defender made a great play, like yeah. great winning football play. Honestly, a lot, I would bet you it's hard to like quantify this, but it seemed to me like Miami made a winning football play at that moment. And Buffalo made a losing football play in that moment, and that that would be an indication of what happened in that game. I, I didn't think Buffalo could come back from it. I'm surprised that they ended up winning. And I honestly, you know, you're probably right. It probably doesn't happen next time. They are the yeah. higher seed though, so they they did win the division. So maybe yep. that'll get them a home game that that helps a little bit. To um, your point though, that fourth quarter stop too, that Miami stopped the Bills from Josh Allen from getting that from getting that yard that they needed, right? Then to only to only make a mistake, you know, when you're trying to do your game winning drive, because of course you needed the touchdown, right? If field goal wouldn't have done. So to a just, you know, I don't know if the receiver broke wrong or if the it was if a the, bad throw. The, it looked like yeah. a bad throw. I don't know what happened with the communication. Is it a bad was... route or a bad throw or the defender jumped it? I don't think the def- mm-hmm. I just think it was a bad throw, right? So, mm-hmm. but to to you know their defense kept them in that game the whole the whole game, and I think. If you have to put money on a team in the playoffs, put money on the team that the defense is playing the best at that time, yep. I think. Yep. Any chance – well, so this brings me to the, this next team, though, because we haven't talked about them at all, is Cleveland. Cleveland has a very, very good defense. Very. I'd, I'd probably say it's the best in the league. Yeah, I think Miles Garrett is a lock to win defensive player of the year from everything that I've read. It's not like something I follow personally closely where I could actually have an opinion on it, but it sounds like he's hit, hands down the defensive player of the year. How incredible would that be? <laughs> if, I mean, if they even made it to the AFC Championship. I actually really like what Joe Flacco is doing. I've never been a Joe Flacco guy, but like watching yeah. him play, he's been freaking playing well. It's actually incredible. I kind of so what, like what seed that. did they get? Oof, because obviously they did the, not Ravens, win. the Ravens so they, won the division, right? So, so they might be are, they might be the five seed, right? Are they the best wild card? I think they're they the best wild the best, card. The best wild card. They have a better record than Miami, right? So. What did they end up with? Twelve? Did they end up twelve and five? The the I think the Browns ended up twelve and five. They were eleven and six. Eleven and six. Okay, Miami's eleven yeah. and six, right? But I don't know what the tiebreaker is, but well, um, so either they're five, six, six, five interchangeably. So Cleveland's playing Houston. That's in another Houston. awesome. That's another awesome story in CJ Stroud altogether. Rookie quarterback. Rookie quarterback that, if I'm not mistaken, has the best touchdown to interception ratio of any rookie quarterback ever. Yeah. I mean, it's at the record for that. And it, it we don't know. I mean, I heard this somewhere. I hope I'm repeating something that's accurate information, but I heard he worked with Tom Brady in the offseason. You know, oh, that, ex- that explains that. Give him the freaking Super Bowl right now, dude. I mean, right now, lock right? It, lock it up. Now, that, that would be an interesting game for me. And that just shows you the CJ Stroud thing. In hindsight, it's easy to say that C.J. Stroud was the better pick. He had the better year than Bryce Young. But in the moment, teams make decisions for different reasons. It's, it is really a freaking coin toss. You know, like, and honestly, part of who is successful as a quarterback depends on the situation that you go into with the weapons that you get. And You know, maybe Bryce Young would have been C.J. Stroud in Houston and the same thing would have happened to C.J. Stroud in 
Carolina, but it's like you really never know what these quarterbacks. Can I just can I just say that they are working with so much more information than we have. The the, the people that you know these and NFL execs and these coaches when they're when they're evaluating when they want to draft, right? They're seeing everything from this person's body language at the combines to how they conduct themselves with the interviews to how you know the, if they can understand the playbook because teams will send the playbook to the to the players that they want interested in and you know I have like. Right with them say did you understand this you understand that so they're making decisions with information we can't even pretend to know and we're, yeah. we're armchair draft people are saying oh they should have taken him it was a lock it was a lock right huh. so um it's so bryce young might have crushed all of those things that you just said and they all might have been heavily weighted and why they ultimately picked him but then it just doesn't translate on the field but it but you are making a decision with data at the point that we like we like you said we don't know but cj stroud's a great story man uh hopefully we can get lucky with a cj stroud type guy at the end of the day though right what what you can't coach or give a player is work ethic and motivation right i mean yeah. our boy drafted number 199 is evident of that and the confidence to be able to say what you say what you mean and, and mean what you say and like walk up mm-hmm. to Bob and said i'm the best decision this organization's ever made <laughs> boom you know, fog it up. I'll bring you six championships, right? So you're getting me fired up. No, it's it's cool, but it's like that's one thing that Tom Brady had, the intangibles that no one's gonna outwork me. I'm gonna be the first person in the building, I'm gonna be the last person to leave the building, and I'm going to and I'm going to study the game. I mean, and then he took it to a whole he took it to a level where the dude only would have like a few drinks a year. He put, I mean, how many people have the discipline to treat their body the way it is? Because they know that that body is their tool. Like, you mm-hmm. know, you, you read about who's that Johnny Manziel, right? I mean, the guy, million dollar talent, five cent head, right? I mean, the second yeah. he got his money, he was like partying and all that stuff. It's like, that's he a acknowledged real- never watching a second of film. Yeah. And doing nothing to put him. Yeah. It's, those guys couldn't be. But the funny thing is, is, somebody's got to pull. I mean, Maybe they're told this, maybe they're not, but everybody in the NFL was the best player at their school. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody in the NFL is super talented. Talent alone maybe gets you there, hey. but talent doesn't keep you there, right? You got to be yeah. willing to outwork the next guy, which is. Hey, that brings up an interesting idea, and we've probably talked about this before because I do want to get to the NFC for a sec before we wrap it up. But you ever hear the idea or the concept I'm sure you have of like, Hey, Alabama could be the worst team in the league in the NFL if they played a scrimmage. Like the years that Alabama won it all, and then the years that Detroit were 0 and 16 or 0 and 17. Like, no no fucking way, way, man. Like you said, even even the the worst people on Detroit are still the best people in college. I mean, these are all professional 53 man rosters with every single person is like a legit stud everywhere, even though they suck in the league against a bunch of kids that'll probably mostly never play. Maybe three of them will get drafted. So, Randy, I'm going to I'm gonna uh, bring an analogy that's going to make perfect sense for you with the scenario we were in that Friday night. Tangway said there were two basketball games where that Cooper flag <laughs> that night. He said the first yeah. game was just a regular high school game, his old high school, right? And the yeah. second yeah. game was that, you know, the, the prep school game. And he said yeah. it was like watching night and day. It was like watching an yeah. NFL team versus a varsity football team. And those are kids of the same age. Dude, I know. Right? So I was telling this to my brother today. It was yeah. insane to think that those kids were the same age because, I mean, the normal main kids on the first game and then legitimate NBA prospects afterwards. And it was, yeah, it was. And the disparity level, like, between the two. So it's like yeah. anybody that's saying, like, any any college team that could beat any pro team, it's just, it's like saying line up any high school football team up to any college football team. College teams got a destiny. It's yeah, exactly. It could be the best it could be the college football team that Derrick Henry played on. They're <laughs> going to decimate him, you know? So. Totally. Yeah, no, it's, it's just a fun it, – it always makes me laugh when that topic comes up with people. I'm just like, there's no freaking way. Uh, these guys, even the worst team has 53 guys that were the best people That's right. on their whole you know, high school and college teams growing up. And, again, they're losing against some people that are best in the world, best in class, but they're still a lot better than a team of 53 college kids where, again, 50 of them will never play football again. There's like that saying in in, uh, in baseball too, because I track a lot of baseball prospects and a lot of the minor league stuff, right? It's like a majority of the players on a minor league baseball team, if you got drafted, were the shortstop on their team because the shortstop yeah. is typically the best player on the team, right? Yeah. And then they just got to – like they got to – like 
everybody shortstops in a team full of shortstops, there has to be the best one, right? So it's yeah. like, you know, obviously your catchers and your position, your first baseman, you know, they have certain talent. Like you're not going to have a first baseman under six feet. You're not going to have a catcher that can't pop up out of the crouch and gun it. But it's like a majority, like of your outfielders, they were playing infield when they were in high school. I mean, totally. you're not going to put the star athlete in the in the in the outfield, right? So hey, honestly, it probably it's probably somewhat true for quarterback too, maybe to a lesser degree, because in baseball, some of those people could play, like like you said, outfield in the pros. But yeah, I mean, best athletes are going to be how those main positions. You see, how many times do you see a quarterback turn wide out? Right, I don't think a quarterback. How many quarterback turn yeah. wide out? Just yeah. didn't work out. Too small. Put you over. Like, you know, they have these. They have these kind of pre preconceived notions on what a quarterback should look like, right? Six one needs to be able to see all the mm-hmm. defensive line, needs to be able to have the proper footwork. How many people just get cut out or don't even get the opportunity? You know, almost like Dustin Pedroia, right? Remember him? Like Dustin Pedroia yeah. said it was five Man. six, probably five four, you know, smallest <laughs> guy. But it's like how many people did you just look at and say, that guy could never do that? And mm-hmm. like Pedroia outworked everybody to be a starting all star MVP second baseman for the Boston Red Sox. And he almost, didn't get, he almost didn't even get a look, right? So yeah. it's kind of cool. So, Hey, before I let you go, who's going to make it an NFC championship? Who's playing 49ers? It's not the Eagles. Um, definitely not the Eagles. The Eagles are definitely I, – I, honestly, I think, it's, I think it's going to be a great game of the Cowboys 49ers. Now, again, I don't – who are the Cowboys playing this week? I do not know the answer. Because I line up that way too, depending on the seeding and the bye. Cowboys just got the number two seed, so – it could realistically be 49ers and Cowboys. I, I don't think there's a scenario. Yeah, there's no scenario that the Cowboys play the Niners before That's the right. NFC Championship. Depending on the Because they, they will reseed. Yeah. The, the Cowboys are the third um, seed? The I thought second, they were second. They are the second seed, right? Yeah, Cowboys are playing the Packers this upcoming week. So, yeah, I, I would love to see Cowboys versus 49ers. I really think that's the only matchup it could be. I mean, anything can happen in the playoffs, oh. but it's just the way things are going. How awesome this is would great that history be between those two teams. a Cowboys 49ers playoff game, a NFC championship game, like the late 80s, early 90s, right? <laughs> they, they, you know, you still had Montana. That was kind of nearing the end of his prime, but still Montana was still a very good quarterback in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Then you had your Troy Aikman, your Emmett Smith, right? So how cool would it be another 49ers-Cowboys matchup where the, 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 the Titans are running into each other? Championship weekend is always a great weekend in the NFL. You had the four best teams playing. So if that was the one game and then it was Buffalo or I think it's going to be Baltimore. I, I think oh, yeah, you pick Miami. But like any, So Miami would be good. Buffalo would be good. It would actually be – when you think of two teams that have some history between the Niners and the Cowboys, if somehow Cleveland made it into – those oh, NFC I, North games, that would be chippy. You know, if you had Cleveland versus Baltimore, those guys would be freaking tearing each other's heads off. That's a whole pod in and of itself, right? Yeah. The team that left, the other team that the, the team that left, and then the new team, the new franchise comes back in, rebuilding from the ground. Like you know, uh, for those that don't remember, the Ravens used to be the Browns. So yeah. so the Ravens picked up out of Cleveland. What was it, what year was this? Ninety nine, ninety eight, late nineties, late nineties. Yeah, right. The owner took them out of Cleveland, brings them to Baltimore, brand new stadium, right? And then yeah. was it two years later, an expansion team, yeah. the Browns come back, right? So come back as an expansion team, still is the Browns. Yeah, but they're but they don't have the history. It's no. I don't understand how they even account for that history part of things. But yeah, it's like a different Browns, but it's yeah. the same division. Those teams all play each other tough in the, so in the awesome. NFC North. Pittsburgh plays them tough, and if that um, was the AFC well, Championship game, I would be okay with that too. And what I'd be okay story. with. That. Flacco yeah. coming back to play his old, you know what I mean? Oh, God. That has to happen. I forget the whole you know, Flacco, Flacco in. Flacco was the quarterback yeah. for, the, for the Ravens when they won. Raven. Yeah. Yeah. So Flacco I hated Flacco back, back then. Now I love Flacco. Not only is it, not only is it the, the old team facing the new expansion team, it's the old quarterback facing his old team. And it's like, wow. it's a storybook that is, I mean, I don't know. It's a Cinderella story for, for sure. I wonder what the NFL script writers have in mind. We'll see. It's rigged. <laughs> rigged. NFL's rigged. Bet on, <laughs> bet on the Browns. They want they want another feel good moment up there. Uh, dude, I love it. Hey, listen, I think this is officially my longest pod. It was fun, dude. I could have probably went for another hour if I didn't have to go to the bathroom so bad. <laughs> so you pull a Matt beer. You got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. I was gonna say you must be wearing a catheter right now. So I, <laughs> it's all time for no big deal. <laughs> um, all right. That's a good talk, buddy. I'll look forward to the next one. We have some other stuff in the works, but that was a good, good talk.
I, I'm going to look forward to what happens with Belichick and to see if we were right or wrong. Yes, absolutely. All so, right, dude. All right, bud. I'll see you. See you, bud.